briefly today. So Spanish, Portuguese, French and English translation is available through a separate Zoom channel. On the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom window, you'll see a round globe icon for interpretation. So if you click on this icon, you can select the channel for your preferred language and listen to the translation. So please note that most of the webinar will be conducted in English, but we do have some of our panelists who will speak in Portuguese and French. Please, uh, everyone, uh, keep your microphone muted during the event. And for the presenters, please also mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Today's event is scheduled for one and a half hours. Um, and during the event, we'll have two global panels with a short Q&A session after each panel. Um, and we're asking participants to add your questions and comments directly into the chat box. And you can do this at any time during the presentations. We will try to collect these questions and address them during the Q&A session. So a few words of introduction to today's event before we kick off. I'd like to first briefly introduce International Rivers. We are a human rights and environmental organisation working globally to protect river systems and the rights of communities that depend on them. We have offices in Brazil, South Africa, India, Thailand and the United States. And today we're joining with Rivers Without Boundaries, Perangua and other key partners from river movements around the world in the Rivers for Recovery campaign. This campaign and global statement express our shared concern for the health of rivers and the importance of protecting these vital lifelines of the planet through the COVID-19 pandemic and the recovery and into the future. So during the event, we'll be sharing a global call to action together with a new report, which was just published last week by International Rivers and Rivers Without Boundaries. And we have a very incredible panel of speakers to share messages from the report and the campaign, as well as their own testimonies and perspectives from around the world. Uh, because of a very global panel, uh, due to time and schedule constraints, some of the speakers will be delivering remarks by pre-recorded video. And today's event will be structured into two panels. So the first examines the destructive legacies of dams on biodiversity, ecosystems and human rights, and the importance of protecting rivers in the face of COVID and other crises. Uh, and the second panel will focus on perspectives on the ways forward for securing a just and green recovery and protection for rivers. Our speakers join us from some of the world's great river basins, including the Amazon and Congo and Mekong rivers and from countries as far flung as Indonesia and Spain, Georgia and Mongolia. Before we move into the formal program, we would like to start by sharing a short video made for the Rivers for Recovery campaign by the wonderful Todd Southgate. So over to you, Laurel, to screen the video. Water is essential to life on Earth. Though 70% of the world's surface is covered in water, only 2.5% is fresh water, and less than half of that is available for our use. Yet global river systems and watersheds are in crisis. They have been dammed, diverted, polluted, and destroyed at frightening rates. The cost to people and Earth's living systems is catastrophic. An estimated 80 million people worldwide have been displaced by dams, and the destructive disturbances downstream of dams have impacted considerably more lives. 25% of the world's population already face severe water scarcity. By 2050, if we continue business as usual, water scarcity will affect half the planet's population. The climate crisis will only make matters worse. Still, destructive industries, such as large dam builders, are currently ramping up projects that will further destroy rivers and livelihoods, while falsely marketing them as clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. This needs to stop. As we rebuild economies and livelihoods following COVID-19, a truly green recovery must protect the Earth's life support systems, safeguarding water sources indispensable to biodiversity and public health. And it must confront the climate crisis in a socially just and equitable way. 
It's a tall order, but we can do it. We must do it. Time is running out. Thank you, Laurel. So I'm very pleased now to introduce our first speaker who will deliver opening remarks for today's event. Daryl Knudsen is the Executive Director of International Rivers. Daryl recently joined International Rivers in 2020, and he brings more than two decades of experience in over 30 countries, channeling the power of civil society movements to create positive change towards social and environmental justice for the underrepresented. Uh, over to you, Daryl. Thanks so much, Maureen. So glad to be here and to see all of you. As Executive Director of International Rivers, I'm honored to be opening today's event and this launch of our report and global action, Rivers for Recovery. It is a collaboration between International Rivers, Rivers Without Boundaries, and so many of our key allies in the global movement for, for rivers. Today also is a special day, it's December 10th. December 10th is International Human Rights Day. And this December 10th is the 72nd anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now the UDHR is highly significant to our discussion today because the critical relationship between human rights and the environment uh, once thought to potentially be in conflict is increasingly recognized as completely interdependent. And as we know, human rights and the health of rivers are intrinsically interconnected as well. When rivers are dammed, when they're polluted or diverted, and ecosystems and biodiversity are degraded and often destroyed, with them, the human rights of local communities and people everywhere are destroyed as well. Another thing this time commemorates is that 20 years ago was the, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the 20 year anniversary of the World Commission on Dams. Now, the World Commission was born out of massive protests, massive protests over the impacts of large dams and their enormous costs for river systems and for dam affected communities. The World Commission on Dams landmark multi-stakeholder process and global investigation produced the Dams and Development Report in 2000. Now, many of the findings of this report are just as relevant, just as poignant, just as stark um, as they ever have been, even today, 20 years later. For instance, that report found that dams had forcibly displaced between 40 and 80 million people from their lands, irrevocably changed the natural environment and strained tax funds through large cost overruns, which on average approach 100% of projections. Another study 10 years later found that dams have comprised the livelihoods of close to half a billion people living downstream. 500 million people whose lives <clears throat> have been negatively affected. The World Commission on Dams report stated that while dams had produced some development benefits, the cost was too much. It said, and unacceptable and often unnecessary cost had been paid by communities, by taxpayers, and by our natural environment. The report put forward a new framework for decisions that would respect human rights, that would promote better water and energy solutions, and that would restore healthy rivers and communities. Yet, despite so many important advances, 20 years later, many of these proposals have yet to be implemented. And today, the global, <clears throat> excuse me, today, um, in the wake of a global pandemic, the issues outlined in the World Commission on Dams report are more crucial than ever. 
Rivers and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity are in crisis, as is human health. Today, over 70% of the world's large rivers no longer flow freely. In the last 50 years, we have lost 83% of freshwater aquatic species. And as of 2019, 17 countries and nearly a quarter of the world's population, a quarter of the world's population, faced severe water scarcity. COVID-19 hasn't helped. It's widened existing inequities and vulnerabilities. It's widened inequities and vulnerabilities that range from the access to health services to clean water and sanitation. At the same time, access to river resources has provided a critical safety net for so many local communities and indigenous peoples during the pandemic. And these rivers and their resources have served as, and can serve as a central pillar of recovery. Communities that have access to natural resources, to healthy ecosystems, to sustainable food systems, these communities have demonstrated greater resilience. Safeguarding freshwater systems would be critical, absolutely critical in our ability to respond and ensure resilience as we recover from COVID-19 and also as we tackle the looming and, gr and grapple with the looming climate crisis. A new paradigm for rivers is urgently needed. The time is not next year, next month, tomorrow. The time is now. We invite you to join us in the global call for Rivers for Recovery. We are calling for a recovery that is rooted in climate justice and protects our rivers as critical lifelines that support biodiversity, water supply, and diverse populations around the world rather than damming and polluting these rivers in pursuit of profit and extractive economic growth. We are calling for a truly, truly just green recovery. A recovery that puts a moratorium on new hydropower dams. A recovery that upscales investment in non-hydro renewables and storage a recovery that initiates new energy plans that prioritize sustainable energy solutions, and a recovery that safeguards protected areas, free-flowing rivers, and indigenous territories. I ask that each of you signs on at www.riversforrecovery.org Sign on as an individual. I did that separately from our organization. <laughs> Sign on as an organization, if you're so empowered. Tell your friends, post on social media. Let's make this a truly global movement because all of us around the globe depend on healthy rivers. Honored to be here with you today and looking forward to the program. Thanks very much for letting me share a few remarks and I look forward to hopefully meeting all of you at some point and working together on the future of our rivers, future of our ecosystems, future of our humanity, and future of our planet. Back to you, Maureen. Thanks so much, Daryl, for your inspiring words, uh, framing our event today. So I'd like to move to our first panel, which will focus on dam legacies and hydropower as a false solution. So this panel will look at the legacies and impacts of dams and the importance of protecting rivers in the face of COVID-19 and other crises. It will highlight concerns over hydro and other river destructive industries um, as a solution for economic recovery and the fight against climate change. To open the panel and share some of the key findings from the report, our First speaker is Eugene Simonov. Eugene is one of the co-authors of the Rivers for Recovery report. He's an environmental activist and expert and international coordinator of the Rivers Without Boundaries Coalition. 
And since 2012, Eugene has focused on safeguarding Lake Baikal from the impacts of hydropower planned on the Selenga River in Mongolia and existing dams on the Angara River in Russia. Eugene, unfortunately, despite being a critical force behind this event today and this campaign, couldn't be with us. Um, so he's pre-recorded his presentation, which we'll show to you now. Hi, I'm Eugene Simonov, and I'm a coordinator of International Rivers Without Boundaries Coalition. And together with International Rivers, for the last half a year, we have been preparing the Rivers for Recovery report, which I'm happy to introduce to you today. Why Rivers for Recovery? Uh, we believe that uh, now we have a very important moment for a paradigm shift. Uh, which is allowed by this tragic pandemic that happened uh, in the whole world. And this allows us to rethink our relation with the earth and relation with rivers. And rivers are subject to many human uses and abuses, and we need to re reduce the pressure on them now. And we need to help local people to regain voice in decision on how to protect and use their rivers. But we are told that hydro dams that strangle the rivers are vehicles of recovery. Uh, we are told that mega projects boost economy and history shows that in Great Depression in the US or uh, during the um, Stalin times in Russia, uh, big dams were built by, sometimes by prisoner labor, uh, to bring the bright future to the nation. Uh, we're told that hydro is still a mature technology providing most of clean energy on Earth, and the world needs to employ all low carbon options to overcome the climate crisis. We are told by the industry that it learned the lessons from the World Commission on Dams 20 years ago and now became completely sustainable. So we need to search for sustainable hydropower and understand whether this is a truth. Uh, our guide is the report delivered by International Hydropower Association in May uh, on the status of hydropower and looking at the hydropower installed in 2019, we see that although it was a very minor uh, 12 to 14 gigawatts, uh, it's still 90% of the projects uh, were destructive in this way or another and definitely not sustainable. <clears throat> Starting with Brazil, which has biggest contribution in the form of Bela Monte Dam, which displaced uh, many indigenous people, to China and Laos, which built four new dams on Mekong River, uh, changing the character of this most bioproductive uh, <clears throat> river of East Asia, uh, to Tajikistan, uh, which has massive blackouts because all resources are devoted to building giant uh, Rogun Hydro, which builds up tremendous foreign debt uh, and uh, threatens the relations with downstream neighbors, and so on and so forth. Read the report. Uh, but okay, probably this is needed to bring us to better climate. It's highly unlikely. First of all, we see that while the contribution of new hydropower uh, is decreasing year by year, uh, more and more solar and wind uh, are installed and hydropower is no longer the uh, preferred choice of renewable energy for almost in any country. Uh, in major agencies published energy shift scenarios which show that hydro will not play 
a critical role in any energy shifts. Uh, and academics published reports showing that hydro addicted countries have uh, less uh, successful development and governance characteristics than those which have more diversified energy mix. Finally, COVID outbreak has shown how unsustainable is reliance on mega projects with the uh, supplies and workforce outsourced in other countries. Uh, a report contains not only general analysis, but country case studies. Uh, and I will talk about red light case studies about countries that went for hydro uh, to do the economic recovery. One of them is Pakistan, which uh, is where the new construction of hydro along China-Pakistan economic corridor causes big protest and uh, which has tremendous dam driven debt, uh, which it difficult with problems difficult to resolve. To Nepal, a country which has um, built more than 100 hydropower plants with only total capacity only of one and something gigawatt, but it lost all its free flowing rivers and now all its projects are strangled by COVID uh, and it needs to somehow resolve the problem that uh, most of other activities in valleys are also strangled by COVID because hydro construction is expected in those valleys. Uh, therefore, uh, <clears throat> it needs to find alternatives, but it has inertia and still chooses new hydro to go out of the crisis. The report also contains the analysis of uh, proposed or ongoing projects which are not online yet uh, and shows uh, how much uh, destruction we could um, avoid if we were not pursuing those projects and choose more sustainable alternatives. From the giant Inga Dam planned on the second largest free-flowing Congo River uh, to tiny Bilaparovskaya being built on money from breaks uh, in Karelia Republic in Russia, which has been the arena of COVID outbreak and two dam failures uh, with pollution downstream for no reason good enough. It's not practically needed by economy. Uh, the statement uh, which, which this report supports, Rivers for Recovery statement, uh, states that false path to economic recovery are those which sacrifice river for economic development, expand crippling debt for countries already having substantial difficult debts, prioritize greenwash solutions, diverting funds for more efficient, uh, better alternatives, promote mega projects as recovery vehicles, and weaken environmental and social safeguards uh, and other laws uh, and increase abuse of freshwater resources. Uh, hydro is an industry that fills in all the boxes and is an industry uh, which we can avoid expanding in future. Uh, this is one of our messages. So thank you to Eugene in absentia for setting out some of the key findings of the report and helping frame the discussion for our panel. So we'll now turn to our global panelists. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing um, Javier Rodriguez um, from Brazil, who's a member of the National Coordination of the Movement of Dam Affected People in Brazil, or MABI. He lives in the Amazon region, where he's active in supporting the organization of local communities to defend their rights in the face of threats from major dam projects. Um, over to you, Robert. Boa tarde. Good afternoon to all of you and good morning to all. I am part of the 
people affected, uh, movement of people affected by dams. And we are also uh, part of a movement of people affected by dams. It's an international organization that fights for uh, the rights of people affected by river dams and a movement that uh, people affected by uh, the projects that purize dams in detriment of the people that live around the rivers. I want to congratulate those, all of you who are organizing this event and who have produced this report. And for today, holding this event today on the World uh, Human Rights Day. This is a very symbolic date for us who fight for the rights of people because everything we have acquired, all rights we have acquired were achieved through fight. We didn't get anything uh, as a present. All the workers uh, who have been, have actively worked and have achieved what today we call human rights. All rights we have are the result of class uh, fights. The theme of rivers, of fresh water, of well-being and of the rivers for recovery and for life of humanity as a whole is also has also to do with the fight between the classes. Water has always been the source of fights between workers and their employees and the uh, higher classes. And today, more than ever, what we have is a fight that on one hand, you have the private appropriation of water resources, appropriation of water. And this week, even, we heard that water will start to be negotiated in Wall Street the same way as oil, gold, and uh, water will also become, be negotiated in the New York Stock Exchange. And the tendency is that the world trend is moving towards turning water into a commodity as a strategic basis able to generate great profit for capitalism. And on the other hand, you have the working classes, the whole population that needs water to survive, that needs water to work, to get its sustenance and uh, its life. And who have with the rivers a relationship of identity, of its own history, its culture, as, as is the case for us here in the Amazon. Here we live on the margins of the rivers. We are born and raised watching the river go by, passing in front of our homes, our cities, and we have a relationship with the river that goes way beyond an economic relationship, a market relationship. Today, water is a source of fights and the rivers are at this, that center. The building of hydroelectric power plants, it's mean also the privatization of a river. When a company implements a dam in the river, it's taking over the property of the, the river. Uh, and to be able to fish in that river, you have to ask uh, authorization for the company, uh, pay the company. If you want to bathe or use the river for leisure, you will also have to pay for that. And if you need the water for consumption, either to drink, to, to bathe or to leave, you will also have to pay for it. So the hydroelectric plants privatize the water in the rivers. This is the first element. The second are the immediate consequences for the, the people uh, who are affected. First, the dam uh, removes the native people from their lands, draws them away from what they have as their culture, their identity, violates all their rights, uh, innumerous rights that the, the world uh, dam uh, commission on dams already uh, are aware of. They have cataloged 
more than 20 rights that are violated by dams, but also the power, the hydroelectric power plants violate the rights of the population as a whole and use the, the, the population who uses the energy. We in Brazil pay the high, among the highest uh, rates for uh, energy and have more most of the hydroelectric plants. And this is supposed to be the, one of the cheapest kinds of energy. Not even mentioning the fact that uh, along with paying extremely high rates for the power, we have very bad service. It doesn't uh, serve the population. An example, for example, is the case of the state of Amapá, also in the Amazon region, who has gone for, for the longest uh, blackout for over 20 days. It started with uh, a blow up in a transformer at a, gen a power generating a substation at the capital of the state that created a fire and the whole state was without power for 20 days. This is a state where you have four hydroelectric power plants, four dams, produces way over what uh, much more than the power that the state needs and this power is transferred to the southeastern states and the state was left in a blackout. Now, the population of the state has to receive their uh, energy, their power supply with makeshift uh, installations from thermoelectrical dams that will gener generate a cost of 3 million reais, 3 mi uh, million reais that will be paid for by the population. In addition to violating the rights of the pollution, of the destruction of nature, and then causing the people to pay again for all of that, it's clearer than ever uh, now in the pandemic. When it started, when the, the toughest lockdown part started here in Brazil in February, March, the consumption of power was reduced in Brazil and up to April, May, we had about 26,000 megawatts in excess in Brazil. So a lot of power was produced and we had low consumption during that period because many industrial and commercial sectors reduced uh, their work and that reduced the consumption of power in Brazil. What did the, the dams do? They opened their reservoirs and up to October, November, the set of uh, dams that accumulate water opened their reservoirs and we have dams that are only at 1% at their volume of water. Itaipu, for example, is at 12% of its uh, vol water volume. In, uh, brother, thank, uh, you, thank you so Kuru, much. We, just, could I ask you just to wrap up Can soon? I ask you um, just to finish quickly? Yeah, Robert? shortly, I'm sorry. shortly. Thank you so shortly. much and sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to in. have to mm -hmm. interrupt, but we have other speakers. We have other speakers talking. Okay. okay, can I conclude? Yes, please do. Então, para ir, para ir concluindo, então, eu queria... uh, to conclude, I would like to show an example of the power plant of Sinop in the state of Mato Grosso that has been implemented in one of the main rivers of the Amazon Basin. It's a power plant that is one year old it's been operating for one year. It's up producing energy below uh, its uh, capacity, and it's producing numerous uh, violations of rights, death of fish, causing diseases, in addition to all the vegetation uh, being destructed by uh, fires around it. So we thank you for participating at this time and being able to contribute to this international fight this global fight in defense of 
uh, water and uh, in defense of life. Thank you so much for your sharing, Robert, and so great to have you with us on this, uh, on this uh, important event today. Um, our next speaker is Emmanuel Masuyu, who is the Technical Secretary of CORAP, a civil society coalition working on environmental and social concerns in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's an environmental engineer and coordinator of the La Riviere Mavi, the River My Life campaign. Um, and Emmanuel has also recorded a short presentation of his remarks. So I'll ask Laurel to screen that for us. Uh, bonjour, uh, je suis Emmanuel Moussou, je suis secrétaire right. technique. Right, hello, uh, I am the technical uh, secretary. Uh, and my name is uh, Emmanuel, and Corab is working today uh, on a campaign. To, uh, stop uh, Inga 3. This uh, campaign uh, has started uh, dying, uh, doing analyses and to work on the impacts, uh, the negative impacts on the uh, development of such a big, uh, uh, such a big um, dam, which is the Inga Dam, it's called Kantanga. So it's a, a, a dam that will be developed in the DRC to produce in total about 45,000 um, megawatts uh, in, uh, as, uh, in its first phase in order uh, in its first phase it will produce 12,000 megawatts. So the campaign Stopping Gar uh, uh, also refers to the impacts that were produced by the first stages of uh, Inga 1 and 2 and uh, this uh, started uh, we built in uh, uh, 1972 and these two dams had many many we need to talk about the environment here, uh, um, especially uh, there are many species that do not exist anymore in the Congo River, uh, and a study uh, had, uh, that had been done before uh, that uh, has identified 45 species, whereas there are only now 50 species, and uh, uh, if this continues, uh, we'll see uh, 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 eventually uh, it will disappear. It must also be noted today that if the flow of the river and it goes there, it goes to about 43 uh, meters per second, and now it is about 23,000 meters per second, and now it is about 23,000 meters per second, and now it is about 23,000 meters per second, and now it is about 23,000 meters per second, and now it is about 23,000 and uh, then economically speaking, uh, we can uh, also uh, regard debt as a big uh, problem. Uh, which resulted from this major uh, project, it was major debt. Uh, it was the DRC was considered uh, among one of the poorest countries, but uh, uh, right, it was just simply because of uh, uh, these two uh, dams that had been uh, poorly managed, uh, managed and that introduced a lot of debt. So it's an, ex uh, an experience that we encountered already, looked in our country, and we don't want to see it again in the future because uh, Inga 3 will be uh, five times bigger than Inga 1 and 2. Uh, um, and uh, please, can one leave the uh, volume up? Uh, because uh, there will be a lot more um, impact uh, for the future. And uh, we are talking here about 47, sorry, no, 37 uh, communities. There are lots of environmental impacts as well. And these impacts can, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, inundate entire villages and uh, dams and valleys. And of course, this will mean that that, uh, uh, we fear uh, uh, that these environment, environmental impacts will have on the communities and uh, once again uh, can be reiterated a debt indirect and, uh, and uh, for this will also cause an indirect, indirect uh, debt for the, the communities. So we believe that this uh, campaign, Stopping the Three, will be able to uh, highlight the better solutions that we can produce, because about 10% uh, of the population has access uh, to electricity. But this is what's being said, that it's being said, but it's actually less than that. So that is what we would like to invite the government to provide alternatives, credible alternatives, for example, to 
le micro dams across the country because the energy potential of the DRC is that in every corner of the country we can have micro dams that can produce on peut développer le solaire le potentiel le plus faible potentiel pour le solaire de la RDC dépasse de loin le potentiel total du solaire de l'Allemagne. Ce qui donne l'opportunité au pays de développer son secteur solaire ou ses ressources solaires pour donner plus d'énergie à la population et cela peut contribuer effectivement à la réduction de la pauvreté mais aussi à l'amélioration de la qualité même d'accès à l'énergie de ces derniers parce que la RBC est un grand pays au monde et il faut que ces ressources puissent servir notamment à, la population, à sa population et au pays de manière plus Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Emmanuel for, for sharing that again in absentia. Um, our next speaker is from Indonesia. So Erhan Hudaya Yunadi is a campaigner for Hakka, an NGO focusing on the conservation of the Lusa ecosystem in Aceh province, Indonesia. And Erhan manages communications and develops campaign strategies against inappropriate and destructive infrastructure projects. Welcome, Erhan. Uh, thank you very much, Maury. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also uh, give my thanks to the International Rivers for uh, this invitation. Uh, as um, Maureen mentioned, uh, my name is Erham and I work for Harka, uh, which is an organization based in uh, the Aceh province of Indonesia. So we're in the northern tip of uh, the Sumatra island and a lot of our work is focusing on the, the protection of uh, the Lhosa ecosystem in Aceh province. So uh, for many of you that uh, may not know, the Lhosa ecosystem is a 2.6 million hectares of uh, rainforest uh, in, in Sumatra. It's one of the richest in uh, biodiversity. Uh, it's key for uh, providing uh, water as well as other ecosystem services for uh, more than 5 million people living around it. Uh, it is also the last place on earth where we have the four key species of tigers, elephants, uh, rhinos, and orangutans living together in the wild. So this is a very, very crucial place to protect and in many other landscape they may have uh, two or three of those species, but currently in, it's only in the Loso ecosystem where we have those four species still living uh, to get together harmoniously uh, in the wild. So uh, one of our uh, parts of our work is to campaign against uh, illegal infrastructures, um, more inappropriate infrastructures that um, fragments uh, key habitat uh, for key wildlife populations, um, may, whether that may be roads, um, dams, and so forth. So uh, one of the stories that I'll be telling today is uh, one of our campaign against uh, Tampur Dam, which is located, uh, which was planned to be located in one of the key one of the key habitats for the Sumatran elephant, which is the key, one of the key migration and a key population that connects um, one uh, Sumatran elephant population in sort of the northern part of Loser towards the southern parts of Loser and it's a key buffer zone for the national park as well. So the plan for the dam itself uh, was supposed to uh, be built and uh, displace potentially displacing one village that has 75 families, uh, in addition to it taking over 4,000 hectares of forest. What would happen, it would have been a, it would have drowned 4,000 hectares of forest uh, with a dam of almost uh, as tall as 200 meters. So a lot of our work uh, focused on mobilizing communities, working with uh, continuously engaging with communities. In addition, we conducted uh, media campaigns. We work with um, local and 
uh, national journalists uh, to cover the stories. We work with a lot of uh, local partners as well to ensure that this issue was uh, very much raised um, within the circle of Indonesia uh, for it to be known that this is uh, a very much inappropriate in infrastructure and has uh, it, it could lead to a massive detrimental loss uh, to the forest ecosystem. And in addition, we also work uh, very closely with uh, Walhi or um, more, more known in uh, abroad as the Friends of the Earth. So they're part of the Friends of the Earth network. Uh, so we work very closely with them to uh, file a lawsuit against, um, uh, on the basis of the permit of the dam itself, uh, because we feel that uh, for such uh, projects, uh, per per the permit itself should not have been uh, issued. So towards the whole of that process, um, we focused on uh, mobilizing communities, ensuring there's a campaign that uh, the, the project is known, especially with the permit being issued, it was a very, very close for it to be in the process of um, development. But luckily throughout uh, the campaign that we did at the moment, the uh, project itself is stopped. So the original company that wanted to invest uh, in the dam development has, um, although they never uh, officially mentioned that they uh, are not uh, building uh, the dam itself anymore, but they have left uh, the project. So moving forward, we're still working very closely with uh, the local communities. We're still engaging with them to ensure that um, um, the, the dam project uh, will not continue moving forward. We're also still continuously engaging with um, our partners as well as looking at um, trying to uh, le leverage our communications and campaign with uh, uh, key stakeholders and potential key investors to disincentivize them to uh, invest in uh, hydropower in the future because um, not just this current dam itself, but in, in parts of Indonesia, other parts of Indonesia, uh, hydropower is um, one of the many um, uh, investments that uh, the government is looking for uh, as a way of, for quote unquote, as we mentioned, clean energy. Um, uh, it, it seems that it, it, it's something that, um, uh, the, the, there's other uh, projects looking uh, towards building more hydropower and we're looking towards uh, working with other partners in the campaign to ensure that no more uh, hydropower investments uh, in the future as we have seen, not just in Indonesia, but uh, looking at the examples from we've seen abroad that uh, it, it, it may seem something very inviting uh, at the beginning, uh, but as we move forward, we see that um, the profits or the benefits that they were mentioning to the communities just did not come. And we also have seen this in one of uh, a dam project that still, um, that has uh, been built uh, in Indonesia in West Java where many communities were uh, displaced uh, as a result of um, you know, building these dams and they were promising a lot of benefits uh, for the local communities. But by 10 years on forward, the dam itself has not even produced uh, electricity that uh, they promised to the local communities. And the other benefits such as jobs, um, the economical benefits uh, has not come to uh, the local communities itself. So this is uh, something that we're still working with um, a, a lot of different partners in Indonesia to continue raising uh, the issue that, um, that the transition towards clean energy is not with hydropower. There's a lot of other uh, potential uh, green energy that's uh, more sustainable much more beneficial to local communities and not 
uh, negatively impacting uh, forest ecosystems. So hopefully that uh, we're looking towards trying to raise the uh, and amplify the uh, report that international rivers have uh, produced as well within Indonesia, and hopefully that could also, um, you know, uh, support our call to um, the government towards actually considering uh, a better policy for um, green energy and uh, transition, trans, a, a, a better transition towards uh, clean energy. Um, thank you. Yep, thank you so much. much uh -huh. Thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your, your comments. So we've heard experiences from, um, from the panelists so far about the impacts that dams have had on biodiversity or our risk having on biodiversity, on local communities, on indigenous peoples. Our final speaker in this first panel um, is Paul Fernandez Garrido. She's an engineer specialized in technical and naturalized fishways design and later trained on dam removal projects in the United States. She works for the World Fish Migration Foundation, where she has been responsible for collection of river barrier inventories across Europe and is project developer of Dam Removal Europe and coordinates World Fish Migration Day. So Powell will be bringing us a slightly different perspective from, from Europe, um, particularly looking at dams that have had destructive impacts um, over long periods of time and are now being removed and, um, and decommissioned in a movement within Europe and, and other parts of the world. So over to Hi, Maren. Um, I cannot, I, the host needs to give me permission to turn on my video. I, I don't have the permission, but hopefully you can hear me at least. Maren? Laura? We can definitely, we can hear you and we'll try and sort out the video issue as soon as possible so we can see you. Okay, great, because I just cannot turn it uh, on. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Paul Fernando Garrido. I'm from Wolfish Migration Foundation uh, from the Netherlands, even though I'm based in Spain. And in our foundation, we basically work on creating awareness, lobbying, and, and obtaining data to improve and, uh, and make people understand the crucial, the crucial importance of river connectivity. Um, and we for for uh, migratory fish populations. So we work in different projects, and I would just like to highlight a few of them in these five minutes. One of them we started it four years ago. It's called Dam Removal Europe, and where what we did in since the start was to investigate uh, these past four years on the dam removal status in Europe. Nobody knew until we published it. Uh, that Europeans have removed over 5,000 obstacles, river obstacles, most of them weirs, weirs, small dams, but also big dams. And uh, we discovered that many national uh, um, legislations in Europe, they promote uh, dam removal, like in the Spanish or Austrian legislation. Some other countries uh, have um, annual budget finance to help finance dam removals. And we have been collecting all this information and make it public in our website, damremoval.eu, to show people why Europeans are uh, demolishing so many dams. At first, European citizens uh, get really freaked out when they hear these numbers, but you never, you can never start talking about dam removal if you don't actually address the problem. And that's something that we did through another project, four years project that we started it also four years ago, and we finished it right this year, where we discover for the very first time, nobody knew, not even politicians, not even the European Commission, we discovered for the very first time the real dimension of the problem in European rivers. Nobody knew the real number of uh, obstacles in Europe. Everybody, in all references, you could find the same number. All Europeans have more than 7,000 big dams. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we had much, many, many more barriers. And actually, after four years, three years and a half, collecting all the 16 dam and weir barriers throughout Europe, 33 countries, we discovered for the very first time that 
we have at least 650,000 barriers. And I say at least because we know I was the responsible of the collection of all these inventories, and we are aware that those inventories were highly incomplete. Most of them were highly incomplete. Our estimation after this four year project was that at least in Europe we have 1.2 million barriers, and the data, the information I'm giving right now, will be published next week on the journal Nature on December 16th, where we will publish how this pan-European atlas, which is free access in our website, you can watch it, uh, uh, how has been done. And the, one of the direct consequences of having the most fragmented rivers in the world, because now we can say we have the most fragmented rivers in the world due to these uh, investigations, is that our rivers are, maybe some people can say I'm very drastic, but they are pretty much dead. They are not productive anymore. We cannot feed from our uh, rivers anymore. And actually, this is another data that we discover and we published this year in July of uh, 28th of July of this year. We pu published in the first Living Planet Index only focus on freshwater uh, uh, migratory fish. We published that 76% it was, there has been in the past, in the past 60 years, 76% of decline in uh, freshwater fish around the world, but specifically in Europe, 93 percentage of decline. And the fragmentation, the river fragmentation we have lived this past century is a, is a, is a direct uh, result, you know, of uh, the, the decline is a re direct result, my apologies, sorry. Oh, due to the, the, the fragmentation. And we need, we need to share all this data to all of you who are fighting for your rivers, who are fighting to keep your, your rivers free flowing. Oops, the alarm, five minutes already. Just one more thing. We have uh, written down a letter, a petition, which we will take to United, United Nations and FAO and some national governments. And uh, we are individually sending this letter to NGOs, to Anglican associations, ministries, research labs and teams, where we are asking to please definitely protect completely free flowing rivers left in the world and to start removing dams as Europeans are doing. So my last thing to tell you all, if you really wanna be successful fighting and protecting your rivers, you need this data. You need, you need, um, you need to, to show politicians, hey, this is not an estimation. This is true. Look what has happened in Europe. Look all the investigations and projects, you know? So we are facilitating this information and their uh, International River team, uh, if you are interested, will share a PDF where I have put all this information for you to have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pal, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing a really rich set of experiences from different parts of the world um, and a lot of deep knowledge uh, about, about the issues in different places. Um, as Pal mentioned, we do have some materials, including from Pal and her campaign, that we'll share with the participants after this event. So we'll be sending that around. Um, we have a brief time now for Q&A, so if you have questions, please post them here in the chat. If you would like to, uh, if you would like to pose a question to the panelists, I have one um, for Pal, which I'll direct to you now because I know you need to leave quite soon. So, for Pal, what was the biggest megawatt uh, in megawatts dam removal from your knowledge that you were involved in or knew about? I'm so sorry, I don't know in megawatts. I can tell you, I I I'm really bad at that. I can tell you on height. Right now, the tallest dam removal in Europe was uh, last year, May of last year, it was 36 meter high in France. And the energy uh, produced by that big dam in Normandy will be replaced by three windmills. And I would like also to point out that not, not only obsolete dams are being removed, also productive energy dams. And I'll tell you that in Finland, the Finnish government is the, is the government which has taken this more, more seriously and they have allocated last year over 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 million euros to remove dams in their country. 
And this year, they decided to remove three active dams in, a, in one river that goes up to Russia because they want to recover fisheries and salmon in that area and they will um, uh, so, uh, cover uh, that energy uh, by windmill too. And that's going to happen next year. So I can tell you that most of the weirs are, uh, most of the dams are small uh, because small dams also are very damaging. People think that just because they are two or three meters tall, they are not damaging and they are, but they are also big, big dams. In Spain, there's one that is 46 meter right now, 46 meter high being studied to uh, removed. So there, there are many. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and I just wanted to briefly uh, respond to Annie Wilson um, from uh, the New York Environmental Justice Initiative and sharing about the Northeast Mega Dam resistance. Um, thank you for reaching out and we would love to be in touch with you on the campaign. So we'll do that follow up after this webinar. And thank you for joining us and being here today. I'm just seeing a question in Portuguese, so I'm going to Uh, but there, uh, there are uh, are there specific I can is, um, are there specific numbers on the removal of dams uh, for the generation of electrical energy question for Paul from Juilson Costa Sorry, I didn't hear the full question. Could you repeat, please? Julian from Brazil is asking if there are specific numbers on the removal of dams uh, for energy generation. I think like quantitative data on how many dams have been removed. Uh, if I, uh, sorry, your voice cut a few times. Maybe my connection is that. Uh, I think you asked me how many dam removals have been already. Um, well, I can tell yes. you. Is that the correct question? Okay. Correct. I can tell you. Uh, I can tell you about heart that France uh, in their inventories. France they have removed. France and Sweden do not make distinction between man remove and naturally collapse. That's something that I would like to highlight because dams, if they are not maintained, they collapse, they fall down, they're not waterfalls. That's the fall, impressions that, fall impression that Europeans have, you know, the, the dams are waterfalls. So France and Sweden, which do not distinguish man removed and natural removed, uh, France has removed already 2,300 obstacles, Sweden, 1,600, uh, uh, Finland, they have uh, man removed over 500, Spain over 350, I'm, I'm, I'm telling on by heart. Um, Estonia, Estonia did the biggest watershed opening ever done uh, by removing 10 weirs last year and they opened up a whole watershed, 3,300 uh, 3, kilometers. And uh, England and, and Wales, they have removed over 200 weirs. These are underestimated numbers, I wanna say that too, because um, oh, well, and Germany. Germany and Denmark have removed hundreds of small weirs, but they don't have a really good inventory. So we are trying to find out uh, the exact number from Denmark and, and Germany. Uh, but uh, those are underestimated numbers because the, usually the numbers are uh, uh, registered or managed by regional uh, or provincial state, and then they go to uh, national state, so that takes some time, sometimes sometimes it doesn't work very well. But those are the numbers. We're talking about over 5,000 um, uh, barrier removals in Europe. So until four years ago, not even Europeans knew about this. And I would like to say something that I didn't say in my talk. During these four years, we have been lobbying and, and communicating with the European Commission, showing the economic benefits of dam removal because everybody thinks that oh dam removal they are doing this river freaks are doing this because of for the fish and for the butterflies and for the happy world and no we are doing this 
that removal is important for liability and, and, and civil protection. It's important for economic reasons and we have been collecting all this information and put it to the European Commission and one of the outputs of the results of this pressure to the European Commission was the dismay for the very first time in the EU uh, Biodiversity Strategy 2030. For the very first time, they targeted to free 25,000 kilometers uh, European rivers out uh, to free from obstacles. That had never been happened before. And that's because of showing them how uh, not only environmentally speaking, but economically, it's important to remove dams. Thank you so much for that detailed response, Pao. I'm going to now need to move on to our second panel because we have a few more speakers lined up. Um, and this second panel is going to um, focus more on the ways forward for a just and green recovery. So this panel focuses on alternative solutions for how do we ensure an economic recovery in the wake of the pandemic, um, and particularly look at examples for community-led and community-supported energy solutions and priorities and recommendations for policymakers, energy planners, and investors. I see that there are a couple of um, additional questions in the chat, and I'm going to, I think these are also good questions to come after our uh, remaining speakers. So I'll, I'll put those on hold, but I will um, pose them after um, the additional speakers have, have shared their remarks. So to start out and to frame our second panel, our first speaker, Michael Simon, is another co-author of the Rivers for Recovery report. And Michael is the Senior Director of Strategy at International Rivers. He has long experience working on rivers and human rights, previously leading Oxfam's water governance program with a focus on the Mekong and the Selwyn basins of Southeast Asia. Um, again, it's a short video re recording from Michael since uh, he's in Australia and it's very late for him there. Good evening. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Michael Simon. I'm the Senior Director of Strategy at International Rivers and one of the co-authors. It's my pleasure at the back end of this webinar to be talking to you about our vision for a recovery. How do we see rivers playing a more central role uh, in stimulus packages as in, and in just and sustainable recoveries? So, our report argues that it's critical to learn from the mistakes. We can't afford to keep going with what we were doing before, which led to so much exploitation and destruction of our natural systems. We believe that, and we argue in the report, that doing so is not only possible, there is evidence to show that this can be done efficiently and play a real role in recovery of jobs while also protecting the environment and ensuring that local communities have a say over their futures. So our arguments cover social as aspects, environmental and economic, and I'll run through those tonight. So we argue that better alternatives are available now. They're essential to a just and a transformative recovery. What's our roadmap for recovery? There's six areas and I wanna read these out to you so, so we cover them because I think the panel will go into these. The first one is we believe that a moratorium on new hydro is essential as a step towards sustainable and just economic recovery to allow those other investments to happen. There needs to be a rapid upscale of investment in non-hydro renewables and storage together with policies to facilitate social and environmentally responsible investment. Thirdly, that upgrades to existing infrastructure projects, hydropower projects to increase efficiency and support the rollout of other renewables rather than building new dams is the way any investment into hydro should be going. Fourthly, that investment in green infrastructure in nature-based solutions that protects and restores freshwater ecosystems and the biodiversity that is central to those ecosystems is is going to be a, a, a base for a just and sustainable recovery. Alongside that, we need the laws that govern freshwater protection to be uh, to be developed. Fifthly, 
we have a chance to look at energy development plans. Let's just not continue business as usual. Let's look at how we can transform energy systems, taking the uh, opportunity to see those investments for local communities, investments in large scale hydro, uh, sorry, large scale solar and not large scale hydro. And lastly, that safeguarding protected areas particularly around rivers and fresh water, can be central to stimulus packages and recovery plans. So we'll hear more of that in the panel and uh, Maureen, who's moderating, can also outline more. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you, but it's been a pleasure to uh, give a little snapshot of that today. Thank you. So thank you to Michael for framing our panel. Um, and our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Nanana Koshlade um, from Georgia, who joined Bankwatch in 1998 and works as regional coordinator for the Caucasus. Um, Manana is the founder of the Tbilisi-based environmental group Green Alternative in Georgia, um, and she's the group's chairwoman as well as its IFI program coordinator. And in 2004, Manana was honored with a Goldman Environmental Prize in recognition of her campaigning work on the controversial Baku Tbilisi uh, Jehan pipeline. Welcome to Manana. Thank you for that opportunity to speak in this very important panel. And um, uh, the Georgia itself is uh, rooted in hydro since 19th century. And while the COVID very heavily hits the country's economy and the people, um, somehow the Georgian government still continue to uh, promote the hydro and, and uh, through promotion of the hydro tries to convince the people that uh, the life is uh, continues to be normal. They are uh, there is ongoing continuation of the issuing of the environmental permits during the lockdowns. Uh, there is like um, you know, making the new uh, laws and subsidies for the just for hydro renewables. And uh, these are really, really angry the people and we have the protest all around the country because the people of Georgia are uh, quite fed up with the already existing hydros and they don't want to see any new hydro development in a country, neither big, neither small, because they understand that the hydro is actually facilitated the land grabbing and water grabbing and it's actually are impacting the people's livelihood, as it was also said. And this situation is continuous on the background when we see that a uh, row of the solar and wind companies who are trying to get the permits from the Georgian government to for the construction of the renewable energy plants and operation. So uh, for now, for example, there is, uh, ongoing a large protest against of the uh, 700 mega Namahwani cascade on Rioni River that it serves the last resort for the Black Sea Atlantic sturgeon and the people are blocking for 46 days the construction of the uh, hydropower plant which is going without permit and the government does not doing anything except of pushing the police to uh, stop the protesters. We understand that with, with the fact that Georgia's electricity system, which has 85% of um, uh, electricity comes from uh, aged hydropower plants, that could not be removed, unfortunately, in a way it's done in the Europe right now. And we, it may be still continue to serve for, um, as the backbone for country's electricity system for next decade or even to, uh, however, this new construction should be fully stopped from our understanding, while with the existing hydropower plants, including the largest ones, there is a need to push and make them more smarter, more productive, and what is also more important, 
uh, more safer for the people who are living on the downstream and even in the neighboring countries. So if we are speaking about the cost uh, COVID era funding, it should not go to the business as the usual and all the international organizations as well as the private sector should understand that um, if they are supporting the electricity development in Georgia, they should support upgrade of the hydropower plants and what is more important, support the Georgia's government to, uh, at the end of the day, develop the long-term uh, energy strategy and the action plan, which is still not exist, uh, provide a high-level signal, for, um, political, um, high-level political signal to the non-hydro renewable energy producers and support the, uh, their development. And what is also most important, we should have the invest in incentives for the energy uh, efficiency. Without decoupling the uh, economic growth from the power demand, the, uh, there is no possibility for sustainable future, neither uh, in Georgia, NADA outside of the, the, the Georgia in the world. So this is the most important to try to create the energy system that is more efficient. And if we have the hydros, this should not be the new hydro and old, old hydro, if it's uh, feasible, should be became much more smarter and productive. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anana, for sharing the experience from Georgia, particularly with the old hydro that needs um, needs upgrading and if efficiency improvements, um, and your recommendations for the government and and investors and others. So our next speaker, Sukarel uh, Dugasurin, is Mongolian coordinator of Rivers Without Boundaries and a human rights activist working on monitoring compliance of IFI finance, mining, and other development projects. Again, Sukarel couldn't be with us and has recorded her presentation. We needed to shorten it slightly due to time constraints. Um, and she had shared some background on energy mining and water infrastructure projects in Mongolia and the threats to rivers. This information is also included in a policy case study uh, in our Rivers for Recovery report, which Sukarel uh, gave input to. So I encourage you to, to look at that background um, in our report for further detail. So her remarks will focus on Mongolia's new NDCs or nationally determined contributions to the Paris Climate Agreement and the implications um, of these in Mongolia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Sukh Karel. I am Mongolia coordinator for Rivers Without Boundaries. The new NDCs have been uh, requested to share my views on this new document. Not being an expert in energy or water technologies, um, I will share my views on what's been mentioned in, these, in this document and why um, there may be problems, issues with this document. In the first place, this document does not mention mining as a major emitter in this country polluter and water and pasture destroyer. Second, livestock was mentioned as a major potential emitter. And the huge numbers of livestock that are reported are not true, they're fake numbers. First of all, um, livestock doesn't grow at that rate. Um, at which uh, the numbers are, are reported. And second, Mongolia stopped counting livestock by the head. They counted, as reported by herders, over a mobile phone. And herders have many incentives to report higher numbers of livestock. Second uh, issue on the livestock is selective use of data. They are using uh, emissions data for intensive livestock farms, which are not the same as nomadic livestock herding. And therefore, that data is questionable. Farming in Mongolia is 
negligible compared to mining and energy and construction sector emissions. And hydro was listed at the top of the renewables, which is not feasible because the hydro projects have been in discussion and have not been able to justify uh, themselves uh, for the past 15 years. And uh, the NDC's calculations most likely not to uh, incorporate the size of forest that will be destroyed by planned uh, hydros and uh, the emissions that will be brought in by the mega mines and their infrastructure to the northern part of the country. Um, what can be helpful? Technical support to CSOs and river movements in Mongolia. Most of the uh, movements fighting for to protect rivers are local communities and local communities need technical support. Uh, there are three major um, myths which need to be uh, revised. First of all, a very strong public opinion building has been uh, happening in the past 10 years. And that is water flowing out of Mongolia should be contained within Mongolia and that reservoirs need to be constructed wherever possible on any free-flowing water. Water reservoirs in amid climates, pros and cons of these technologies in arid ecology is the type of technical information that is needed to bust the smith. Freedom from Russian dominance in energy, uh, small decentralized renewable solutions, technical information needed to beat this drive for continued uh, investment um, into uh, an old dying uh, central energy grid. Unpacking the new NDCs and Vision 2050, plans for campaign outside Mongolia. Campaign outside Mongolia has proven to be much more effective than campaigning inside. For example, the US Millennium Challenge account uh, allocated its money not to a uh, dam on Tulu River, but on um, infrastructure technologies urban technologies uh, in Ulaanbaatar or the China's Exim Bank um, redirected its financing to a more or to a less harmful project than the egg hydropower plant. So these are my uh, thoughts uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you to Subgaro. Our final speaker uh, is also from Brazil. Uh, Joison Jose Costa is an electrical engineer from uh, Maranjo in Northeast Brazil. He's a specialist in renewable energy, focusing on solar photo photovoltaic systems and distributed generation. Since 2014, uh, Joison has been the executive coordinator of a national civil society network called the Front for a New Energy Policy for Brazil. Over to you, Joyson. Good afternoon to all of you. Can I open my, my video? Can you allow me to, please? Okay, obrigado. Então, muito rapidamente, é, agradecer ao convite da International Rivers por fazer parte uh, do Thank lançamento. Thank you for the invitation from International Rivers to be part of the launching of such important publication and campaign. And I'm going to speak quickly about our point of view regarding what we believe as a front for the energy policies in Brazil. 
as a counterpoint to the continuity of the expansion of hydropower plants, I'd like to bring in a simple understanding that we are also learning how to build, which is the understanding of the energy transition that is fair, inclusive, and of the peoples. It must be fair because it cannot violate rights and generate more inequality. In, it must be inclusive because it must include actively the people in a needed movement of energy transition, allowing them to produce part of or the whole energy that they need. This that this transition allows them to be a the consumer instead of a consumer a producer consumer and it must be of the peoples because the people must be listened regarding the best ways that we must proceed regarding the energy policies in the country these are not the qualities of the re centralized and renewable energies so therefore we advocate in favor of the decentralized energies and we don't we do not defend the renewable energies that uh, for example uh, sun or wind energy that are um, produced in a by many ways uh, there are projects uh, that are going to begin to be built in brazil over 2006 2, 2 million 60 thousand megabytes in large wind park centralized in the northeast region of brazil and this power this and sun power also in construction uh, at any time large amounts centralized and for us this way of expanding must not be the way we should move on forward because it does not meet the qualities that we believe should be in an energy transition so what should be the steps of the way the path that we advocate first of all a regulation favorable to decentralized production connected to the network allow the people to have access to the distribution network by means of their own concessionaries second point allow the people to commercialize market or make a compensation that are in favor of them uh, commercialize to market based on the main incentives uh, that the countries that are champion the sun energy which is the premium fee so this a beneficial fee uh, this is what happens in brazil today a compensation system i'd like to give you an example in brazil we have currently over 348 thousand micro plants of sun energy that uh, produce 4.2 gigawatts of power installed this is much more than the centralized sun power that are produced and account for 90 percent of the whole production of Bellomont uh, plant which is of 4.5 gigawatts I'd like to show you now here that exactly now in the place where I am, part of the energy that I am using is generated by such a system, a photovoltaic sun system, uh, which is, a, is equipment, an inver inverter, which is equipment that transforms the photovoltaic energy that are, is in, installed on the roof and converts it so that it can be used by the equipment. So part of the energy that I'm using now is generated by such systems, which are systems that we advocate. The second step would be the funding, accessible financing and FAIR. Uh, one of the main barriers for such a system is not the cost itself, but rather the possibility of the people to reduce a long time the cost of the implementation of such systems, which is what they already do when they pay monthly their energy. They pay monthly their energy fees. So it's not paid every five years or every 10 years. So naturally, these public services, public utilities are diluted in time and this is what must be done for the implementation of such systems and the third step would, would be to uh, to accelerate the installations through cooperation of communities like 
community generations. So in Brazil, this is very much possible. So distribution of energy through cooperatives. And in this way, we divide not only the costs, but also the benefits. And to conclude, to create uh, new innovative arrangements. In Brazil, we have the experience of what was called social, social sun energy, sun power, manufacturers, which is a way to empower the communities, not only in the implementation of the technology, but also in producing these very equipments by means of the producing solar panels uh, that are artisanals, but with quality and efficiencies of the commercial ones. And so I, don't, I didn't have much time, but I would like to state that an inclusive of the peoples and fair energy transitions with following these three steps as a feasible way for a green recovery. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, setting out that inspiring vision and recommendations oh, for us. I know we're a little out of time, but I do have a couple of questions from the chat that I'd like to put to the panelists. Um, and so the first one uh, from Alessandra, WWF Brazil, and maybe I'll put this to Joyson, but if other panelists would like to, any other panelists would like to answer, then uh, invite you to do so as well. So the justification for hydro uh, plants is that they guarantee steady non-intermittent energy. Solar and wind sources are intermittent. How do you think it is possible to solve this great technical challenge? Is, is storage the only option for this? Can I comment on it? Yes? All right. So, yes, this is one of the justifications of the excuses of the status quo of the mainstream sector that they say that as a barrier on the energy matrix that these energies are non-continuous. Um, but the Brazilian government by means of research and by means of a project of international cooperation shows that this is possible to do a more a faster insertion that, than the one we have in Brazil. Because uh, Brazil, we don't have uh, such a high percentage of sun power energy in our matrix. The wind energy we do have uh, because of recent uh, pro programs of implementation, but we must increase this its but share in a safe way. One of the ways is use the very uh, the very windmills that we have in our Brazilian park as a way to uh, offer a battery when there is a need of fast um, initialization to operate in this fast uh, source, which is, uh, so I see this discourse much more as a lobby to use natural gas as an energy source for the energy, the so-called energy transition, because natural gas has this quality of fast actioning to provide a firm energy and quick energy. So I see this um, barrier of for the insertion of the wind and solar energy um, as mo much more of a discord than, than of a technical uh, reality. In a country such as Brazil, we we see that the seasonality among regions can be compensated from the point of technically wise. So therefore providing a more aggressive insertion. We of course have a limit and this is very clear. We cannot, we cannot have an energy matrix with just one source of energy. It's always interesting to have a mix in your generation matrix. 
but we can advance much more in the sun energy and we advocate that such uh, addition comes from the decentralized generation which already today accounts for over one gigawatt of uh, power installed uh, coming from the decentralized plants showing its potential to provide that. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Joyson, for that. I have one more question to pose, and I think this is from Isabel. I'll, I'll pose this one, I think, to Manana and other panelists, if you'd like to comment as well, please, please do so. So Isabel says there's so much evidence for the severe impacts of dams, as we've heard uh, throughout this event from our speakers. So can you explain the main reasons that decisions to construct dams are still being made? And what can scientists do to help provide the evidence needed to inform decision making? Um, I think this is a very good question in terms of why the governments are st still trying to get more hydro. And here I would say that the hydro is, uh, uh, as it is expensive tool, it also have the quite a lot of the corruption risks. And where you have the corruption risk, often you have the cognitive interest of the politician to get some kind of the use of this huge amount of the funds coming for the larger on this even for small hydros because if you compare now the prices for hydro are quite high so uh in case of the georgia we are somehow more and more uh sure uh, ensured that there is simply uh quite some deals between the politicians and government representatives and the companies for these high expensive plans and this is the one of the and for example we have the case of the project uh, of the nenskra dam in svalneti where the uh, international monetary fund says that this uh, dam financial setup may impact the georgia's macroeconomic parameters and georgia should suppose to pay six percent of uh, its gdp from 2021 this kind of the assessments are really really raise the concerns about how much the corruption is rooted in the hydro uh, industry in case what the um, science can um, how the science can help you know science ca uh, science can help us in uh, the different ways starting from uh, first of all providing the really real clear guidance how to do the uh, transformation uh, towards the renewable energies like um, bring more tools to our decision makers because uh, when we are speaking about the transformations even to the in the new uh, member states of the european union which is not that um uh, that um, progressed in that way the governments are often try to claim that these uh, countries are uh um, rich countries and this why they can afford uh they can afford uh this um, decentralized system smart grids and so and so on so i think the science should uh, work more with the decision makers showing them the technical progress which existing nowadays it's really here and they can really use that and it should be done in very public and transparent way in a way that the government uh, cannot really um, how to say twinkled and um, so don't take into account uh, what the uh, scientists say thank you thanks manana did any of the other panelists want to comment on that If not, I think, I mean, we're already over time, so I think we might uh, conclude our program for today. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to each of our incredible speakers for sharing your time. Um, and sorry that we could only just start to <laughs> scratch the surface of the knowledge that you had to share with us today. 
um, and the breadth of experience that you brought. Um, but it was wonderful to, to hear from each of you. Thanks also to our interpreters for your very expert and smooth communications. And thanks to all the participants who joined us. Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we'll be sharing some additional materials with the registered participants as a follow up to the event. And we'd also like to encourage you, as a few have already done uh, in the comments and the chat, to reach out to us about ways, if you are interested to be a part of this campaign, ways we can work together on it um, and uh, how we can collaborate. And to everyone, we encourage you, if you haven't already done so, please sign on to the Global Action um, as an organization, as an individual. We'll be keeping in touch with those uh, who have signed on to the campaign about the next steps and taking it forward and, and ways to collaborate as well. So um, it's a good way to be a part of things um, and stay connected. So once again, you can sign on at uh, www.riversforrecovery.org. And please also feel free to uh, read, our, read our report. It has more details on um, a lot of the subjects we've touched on and our recommendation for a way forward um, for protecting rivers through the recovery. Um, reach out to us if you'd like any further information or have further questions as well. Big thanks to everyone once again for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Let's go forward together. <laughs>